get this uh, started so that you can have a recording of this. Okay, there we go. All right, so I'll just I'll just follow along, but you just keep going with the PowerPoint. Don't worry about my slides at all. Okay, uh, so welcome. Um, I think I'm going to do maybe a snapshot of my intro, and then I'm going to fast forward to the uh, elm tree. Um, my name is Chris Stretch. I'm a licensed psychotherapist, also a peak performance coach in the community. Um, how I got to PCA is basically um, I've been working in the community doing uh, some performance coaching. I love youth. I love uh, young athletes. Um, as little as you know, four and five years old, I was at a kids camp at Miracles High School today. One group, we had a three and a half year old and uh, it was awesome. You know, you can always teach kids to refocus and conscious breathing. That's those are the two things that at least the young kids can get. So, um, and um, so, yeah, and, and, and how I got is, I, I, you know, I, I played uh, uh, professional sports. I was a in minor league baseball player for a year. I also uh, was a all regional all conference at UC Davis um, for baseball, but actually I got into Davis to play football. Because I was a quarterback in high school, and uh, so that's really um, how I got here. But one of the most important things was is while I was in grad school getting my master's program, and you know, if we a longer version, I would talk about how addiction led me to this because, and then addiction led me to understanding my issues as a young athlete. But we'll just fast through it forward. <coughs> while I was in grad school, I coached um, seven to nine year old boys baseball. There were two teams. There were the um, the travel team, and then they, they had an overflow of kids that weren't good enough for travel, and they called them the club teams, and we played in the local pony baseball league. I went from having 15 kids, and I was I was excited, and I was, I was positive, and next thing you know, the 15 turned into 20, turned into 25, and the first year I had 30 kids, <coughs> excuse me, 30 kids, so we turned that into two teams, and then the next year we had two teams, and then the year after that, one of the groups went up uh, an age group, and they wanted to keep me as a coach, so I had three teams. I was responsible for 45 kids. I had two 10 year old, uh, seven to nine year old teams and one 10 to 11 year old team. So I was, I was just knees deep in it. And because I'd already started some psychological, uh, psychology master's training, I, I was really, really putting into play some of this, uh, behavior modification with these young kids. They were like my, uh, you know, my, my, my lab research was trying to see what I could get through to these kids in terms of, um, you know, attitude and, and, and mental skills. So, so that leads me to PCA. And uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is the Elm Tree of Mastery. So um, here in a second, we're going to listen to what Carol Dweck has found about um, praising effort over talent. Now, one of the great things about PCA is, is that we try to, everything we present, we really try to back it up with research. And Carol Dweck is written this book called Mindset, the New Psychology of Success, and she's got a lot of great things to say. So before we get into what Carol Dweck says about praising effort over talent, I just wanted to throw it out there. When I said, when obviously this, this what she's going to talk about is one is for the payback as to why would that be important to praise effort over feedback? So Kelly, could you tell me what comes to mind? What, what's why is it important to praise effort over talent? Because not every kid has talent was the first thing that came to my mind. <laughs> yeah, not every kid has talent. Ruben, what's the first thing that comes to mind for you? Yeah, thank goodness I had some coaches that praised effort because otherwise <laughs> I wouldn't have gotten praised. But uh, um, yeah, because uh, because sometimes uh, you, you you try hard and you do the right things and your opponent's better and does it you know, it's a little taller, a little faster, a little stronger. And so you don't get the result you want and they're doing Great. it the right way. They might be doing it the right way too. Great. I agree. Totally. So let's see what Carol has to say about it. So we play Carol's tape and I'm actually gonna, uh, we'll go to the next slide. Now keep in mind, these slides come down one by one by one by one. So yep. I'm a athlete experience and it's going to say, how do you get athletes to believe they can get better? And yep. so, you know, one of the important things that I think is to mention about what Carol said is the two things I really want to highlight. Number one is, is that, and she talks further about this, and this is big in our community here in the South Bay, and, it, and she's put out there this idea of a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And I think um, what both of you alluded to was helping you know, athletes have a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. So actually, before we go about helping our kids improve, 
really the most important thing is that they believe they can improve. And so how do we get athletes to believe they can get better? Well, one thing to point out is, is that we're really aiming for a growth mindset. And this is not a growth mindset that just might just pertain to athletics. This is a really about a mindset about themselves, a mindset about their life, a mindset about education. It's a mindset that there are new possibilities for them they've yet to discover due to a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset where we're kind of like stuck with our conditioning or stuck with whatever we have. And uh, to bring the psych uh, psychology into it, uh, years ago, they used to think that the brain uh, was a neuro set. So it's another way of thinking of the brain is it's very fixed. It, 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 it doesn't adapt. It doesn't change. We're set on our you know, uh, 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 um, genetic path and we go there um, and, uh, versus neuroplastic. Now, recent psychology has proven that our brains are neuroplastic. They shape, they form, they adapt. So this idea of having a growth mindset is very much connected to this idea that neurologically speaking, we adapt, we grow. And so what we're, we're doing is we're using the way we coach players to help them develop this growth mindset that in turn is going to help them change neurologically in their experience, which is wonderful, right? So how do we get them to do that? Well, we have some, some really great ideas on this. Um, number one, we, we, we talked to them about valuing effort more than talent. And the second thing that Carol said was super important. Some of the things that I'll talk about that you're taking in, they seem common sense. You might think, oh, of course. But a 12-year-old, a 15-year-old, a 17-year-old, 18-year-old, and even what she talked about with some of these college athletes, they don't always know it. So it's really important for coaches not just to value effort more than talent, to talk about it. So that's the second one. Become a noticer of effort. Become a noticer of effort. The previous one about uh, the the, uh, the the emotional tank was having that five to one, you know, positive to negative. If, if I'm a noticer of effort, that gives me a, a, a wonderful ability to have that five to one ratio. Um, attribute success to effort. And there's a quote at the bottom. I'm going to, there we go. And that really talks about that was a great play. You've been really working hard in practice, and it shows. And it goes right back to what Carol says, that athletes that are directed to their effort and their practice start believing they can improve more than other athletes. So that brings us to the Elm Tree of Mastery. So one of the things I love about PCA, I love being a part of PCA, is we break it down to some, a, a few, not too many, simple ideas that can help you, you know, right when you're right in the middle of coaching that you can use right along the way. So we're going to do a little, a little um, visualization exercise. So I want both of you, Kelly and Ruben, to imagine you're inside my brain right now. <laughs> and I want you to imagine you're watching me think. Now, why is that? Because right now I am performing. Right now I want to be successful. Okay. And I'm going to give you two ways that I could think about this. Now, Starting out, I want way number one. So watch me think and tell me what comes up for you. What do you feel? I could think about it this way. Are you ready? Ready. Are you in my mind watching me think? I'm in your head. I wonder how I'm going to do. How's this going to end up? Is it going to be good? Is it going to be bad? And how am I going to do? How are they going to grade me? How are they going to talk about me to other people? I don't know. How's it going to happen? Oh my gosh. Other people have been before me. How do I compare well to them? Do I compare well? Someone might have been perfect. I might have to be perfect to have succeeded at this. I don't know. I got to be perfect. And oh my gosh, mistakes are not okay because I have to be perfect. I got to be perfect because I got to be better than that person that I compared to. I got to be perfect. I got to be perfect. Mistakes aren't okay. That's option number one. By the way, you just went through all my thinking on the first tee every time I tee off for a round of golf. <laughs> all those. those are... <laughs> all right. We can always do the tree and master with ourselves, right? Yeah. And then we watch best effort. Here we go. This is an opportunity for me to learn something. I'm going to have an attitude that I could learn something here today about myself, about Ruben, about Kelly. Here we go. Mistakes are okay. I make a mistake, clean it up, let it go. Here we go. All right. So what came up for you, Ruben, as those two different – Streams of thought. Well, the, the, the first one, how, how, can, you know, how can you accomplish anything uh, with all those thoughts and 
uh, all that self doubt and all that pressure you're putting on yourself. Um, you know, how, how, how are you going to accomplish anything? Um, uh, and then this, you want me to talk about the second one too, or you want Kelly to talk about the second oh, one? Kelly contributes. Yeah. Kelly, yeah. Could you? yeah. I just, I mean, you're just relaxed. Your mind's clear. You're looking at the next opportunity as a challenge and you're not letting it phase you. So one of the things, and I don't know if you guys remember the old movie, uh, Bull Durham, when uh, Kevin Costner says to Tim Robbins, you know, stop thinking meat, you're going to hurt the team. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things at PCA, and we're going to go down to actually explaining the Elm Tree of Mastery, is that we at PCA, we believe, that, yes, like Kelly said, we want to be more present. And we want to get out of our heads and into our experience and play the game as it flows. But we give directions or at least guidelines on how to do that. And it really starts with how we define success. And if you look at the scoreboard definition, what was the first thing I did? I really got into the results. I, and, I, and to get into the results, I have to leave this moment here with you, and I have to think about how I'm doing and somehow evaluate myself. That's going to take me up into my head. When I focus on effort, I can be here with you. I can be present. Okay? The next one is comparing myself to others. You know, I have to think about other people, and I have to think about comparing myself to other people. I'm back up in my head. You know, if I'm learning, I'm evolving, I'm adapting, I'm growing, I'm going to be here with you. I'm going to be present. And from that, mistakes are going to be okay with the mastery definition, where with scoreboard, mistakes aren't going to be okay. Now, it's so interesting. It, this seems so rudimentary I, I, for me sometimes. I'm just like, of course, that makes sense. But wow, I think, first of all, we live in a culture which really emphasizes results. Um, I live in an area, it's, it's, a, it's a highly uh, uh, affluent area. Um, where I had an 11 year old yesterday come in my office and his dad was reaming him for, um, for making excuses to his coach. Uh, you know, it, it's just, it's, it, we, we live in a culture and we contend with this highly competitive athletic environment really be more about the scoreboard definition of success than the mastery definition of success. And so as, as, as much as it seems like common sense, I think if you really dig beneath the surface, um, we really are more in the scoreboard definition. And at PCA, we want to really help all of you coaches uh, coach more based on the mastery definition of success. Next slide. And because what, what, what we find, and we have you know, data and research to, to support this, is that uh, research shows that when we have more of a mastery definition of success, we're controlling things. And, of course, sports psychology 101. Where you, well, first of all, I'll say, where your attention goes, your energy flows. I love that quote. Where your attention goes, your energy flows. And Sports Psychology 101 is focusing more on what you can control than what you can't control. So the Elm Tree gives us directions on how to take our energy, flow it into ways that we can control versus what we can't control. What happens? Anxiety goes down. Self-confidence goes up. I like to think of self-confidence not as a mental skill. I like to think of self-confidence as the result of mental skills. So if I can prepare myself mentally, my self-confidence is going to be there naturally versus, you know, and that goes back to that gross mindset, fixed mindset versus a lot of people talk about self-confidence as though you either got it or you don't. Well, to me, if you got an effective way, an effective mindset and a way of looking at what's going on, your self-confidence is naturally going to go up. So let me get over here and then hold on one second. Sure. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, there we go. So, the Elm Tree of Mastery. Mastery gives players a feeling of control. And what we find from our, our research is that it helps them work harder and stick to it longer. So, we have a scenario for you. And so, I want to read the scenario out loud. And, and you, know, you can bring in maybe a past situation where you went through this. Or you could also just imagine what you might do. But, sorry about that. Phone wasn't connected to my computer, but I have to turn the volume. And here we go. The scenario is your team tends to play tentative, ten tentatively, and lets the opponent drive the action. What can you do, Kelly? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Um, first thing that comes to mind is they're scared and they're feeling like they're going to get beat going to the game. So I would probably try to just refocus everybody 
on, um, you know, just give them a little bit of reassurance that what they're doing out there is good, um, pointing out specific things they're doing well along the way and, and pumping them up. Nice. Yeah, I think so. And Ruben? Yeah, I think, you know, ten, the word tentative sticks out in my mind about that scenario. And I think I, I got to think that they're afraid of screwing up. They're afraid of making mistakes. They might be afraid of losing. So somehow I got to convince them, remind them that um, they're allowed to make mistakes and um, that uh, I want them to, I want them to, uh, I actually want them to make mistakes. I want them to push themselves so that, so that they do make some mistakes. Great. Great. And one of the things that I like to think about with the Elm tree is I think it goes effort, learning, and uh, mistakes are okay. But then we go backwards, you know, and we say mistakes are okay at maximum effort. So we go M E L so we can learn. See when mistakes are not made at max effort, I don't really know what I'm adapting and, and what I'm fixing because I didn't give my best effort. So effort learning mistakes, but making sure mistakes are at max effort so I can learn. I think it all kind of works together. So, you know, from the, uh, you know, the Elm Tree Toolkit, you know, the takeaways that, that we've, you know, we share with you is that focusing on effort is the key to, to performance. Assertive, aggressive play comes when there is no fear of mistakes. And from the toolkit, we have become a noticer of effort, reward un um, unsuccessful effort. We really like that. When I was in college, what I used to do is, instead of looking at my batting average, I had my own little charting system. And what I would do is I would chart quality at bats. So at bats, when I went up, I gave my max effort. I had a solid plan. I stuck to it. And I did everything I could to succeed. I gave myself a, a quality at bat. And it really gave me a way of going up to the plate. And my goal was more quality at bat than it was uh, getting a hit. And of course, um, the mistake routine, which we're going to get into. So, you know, mistake routines are great. I've actually added the mistake routine to my talks at some of these camps. It's really fun. And so Curtis Granderson here is going to explain to us, you know, how it really works in baseball. So boom, listen to Curtis Granderson. Yep. So one of the things I'd like to do is, first of all, I want you to tell me what sport you would be playing if we were to talk about having like a mistake ritual so we can get an idea of what that sport is. So Kelly, what score, sport would you be playing? What's your sport? Play basketball. Basketball. All right. Ruben, what sport would you be playing? I'll say volleyball. Volleyball. Okay. So here's what I want to do. Let's <laughs> practice a mistake ritual. So what's going to happen is, is I'm going to say you made a mistake and then I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five. During that five seconds, I want you to think of something you can do to let go of that energy. We are all competitors. None of us like mistakes. <laughs> we recognize we need to make them and we're gonna learn from them, but none of us like to make mistakes. And being angry is about being human. So let's find a way to discharge that anger in about three to five seconds. So, Kelly, you might have to find a spot between possessions to let out that anger. Ruben, it's, you know, there's about 12 seconds between volleyball points. So I'm going to say mistake. I'm going to count to five. And then when I hit five, I want you to look directly at me, and I want you to say, Kelly, I want you to say, next play. Ruben, I want you to look at me and say, next point. Ready? Now, it would be even better if you visualize the mistake that you commonly make. All right, here we go. And... Make a mistake, but do something ritual ready. One, two, three, four, five. Next play. Next play. There we go. So that's a really good way of, of helping your, your, your athletes so that they can have a, a mistake routine so that when they – and the other thing too is when we, when we connect neurological functioning, when we connect our, our, our brains to something physically, it creates this habit. So if I use a mistake ritual as a habit, that's actually going to help me move on, flush that, that mistake, you know, get rid of that anger and move on to the next point. I call it next pitch point player possession. 
So, so there we have it. We have the Elm Tree of Mastery and really love this as a, a tool for all of you. And, um, and then we'll move on to honoring the game. So. All right. Chris, um, I know a question Ruben's going to ask you because he wasn't yes. on your first one, but I want you to tell him uh, what were some things specifically that you were working on between your last demo and this one? Because I can tell you, you did it. What I The suggestions I gave you the last time, you did absolutely capitalize on it. So I wanted to know what were some specifics that you were working on to make this one better than the last one? Uh, I wanted to make it a little more um, in sync, a um, um, little quicker introduction, um, a little less, um, a little, although I, 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 I probably could have done a better job, but a little less in the beginning of a slide, get more information. Well, there's some slides where I would obviously talk about it, but then when I was asking for feedback, a less in the beginning, trying to get more input from, from the, but I think more like in sync and, and, and really um, more uh, uh, defined in terms of what I was talking about for each slide. Less yeah. all over the place. Does that yeah. make sense? That's what I noticed big time. Much more concise, much more simple, and much more focused on exactly what you were talking about. It was very, very well done. Very well done. Since Ruben cool. didn't get to see you last time, I'd love to hear uh, his feedback first. What did you like most about what Chris just did, Ruben? And then if you have any suggestions for him. Wow, I, I like a lot about it, Chris. I really do. Um, I. <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited uh, for, for PCA. <laughs> um, you know, you know I, 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 like, I liked your pacing. You know, I think, I think you, you, you gave us enough at each part, um, but, it, but it was also thorough. Um, I think you have a nice mix of using PCA language terminology and blending it with your own expertise, your own background. Mm -hmm. your own way of thinking about the same concept. And um, I really feel like I learned a lot. Um, and I think that this um, demo is one, like if I watched it a couple of times, I could draw a lot of it um, to put in my own uh, trainer toolkit, you know, on, on this section in particular. So yeah, Chris, you know, you're confident, you're poised, you have an awesome voice, your tone. Um, you're animated, but not to to the point of distraction. Um, just boy, I just think <laughs> Kelly, I can go on and on. Uh, is I, I thought it was very, very good. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, that if I could just get your feedback, but thank you, Ruben, I really appreciate it. One of the things that I I, I struggle with is I I, I find myself um, wanting to do. Um, how should I say, non-typical, non, like, whatever, um, I guess, typical interactions with the crowd. So well, give me an example, give me an example. Like, I, I, I have a hard time just going like, what do you think about, you know, effort versus, you know, I wanna, I wanna engage uh, the, the people in a way that's a little bit um, original. Please. Um, give me an example. Give me an example. Please. Well, I, I, I thought the example, my you know, my jump in my mind thing was a little bit original. I, oh, was, I just wanted okay. to. Work. So, so love I love it. that. Love it. We love that. We love that because, no, it, it's it's on it's on track and it's yeah no, Chris, you 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 know what? Um, I think Kelly's going to give you the green light to do that. Um, and you you know I think I think your first couple times out. You, you're, you're going to be a little more conservative with that than you will eventually be. You, you know, um, John Wooden, John Wooden um, used to say, you got to learn the trade before you learn the tricks of the trade. And, and I think, you know, both, you know, I think you, you got the trade and I think you got plenty of tricks up your sleeve yeah. and it's just a question of, you know, how many of those tricks do you pull out in your first workshop or two? And then, uh, you, no, uh, you, 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 we, we don't want to put you in a box, Chris. Mm -hmm. We don't want to put you in a box. We want you, we, you have a lot of personal magic that you bring to this and we don't want to, we do not want to hold you back on that. Um, Kelly, do you want to add to that yeah. in any way? So, I mean, Ruben knows my advice is going to be bring it on, man. Whatever you can, <laughs> whatever you can come up with that will bring a point 
Um, I, I try very hard to make my workshops as far away from a lecture and presentation as possible. Um, but as Ruben said, what I have learned is there is a point where it's too much. And so over the past nine years of doing these workshops, I've found certain things that work really well, certain things that I've tried that I thought, oh, this is going to be awesome. And it just, it's fun, but it doesn't hit any points home as strongly as others. So, so, so Chris, my suggestion Chris, is give it a shot, yeah. give it a try. Um, I mean, I've had people at workshops juggling while when it all cost coaches were screaming in their face. And, you know, it was fun. It was entertaining. But at the end of it, I don't think I debriefed it enough to make it a really yeah. valuable part of the workshop. So I've edited it. I've changed it a little bit more. Yeah. So, you know, instead of juggling and balls flying everywhere, now I have them try to balance a pen on the back of their hands. You know, oh. you know things like that that, like, I've adapted to make the point across different. Um, for Elm Tree of Mastery, I have a scoreboard focus coach and I have a win it all cost coach and they're literally have a team in front of them and they give them a 30 second halftime speech. One's win it all cost, one is scoreboard focused and they get into it. They are, the win it all cost coach is screaming at his players. And then the, the um, mastery focus coach, same team, same situation, same scenario, give them a halftime speech. And you just and, and you can hear a pin drop when I say, which coach would you be more motivated to play for? You know, that is so much more impactful, I think, than saying, here's what scoreboard coaches focus on. Here's what mastery coaches focus on. You know, yeah. anything like that is awesome. And I think you'll get a sense for, you know, really the key is the take home. Are these coaches going to change their behavior when they go out on the field? And you know, what's, what's good and fun. And, and, you know, I loved what you just did. I love to get in my brain. I mean, that whole way, as soon as you said that, I'm like, yeah, this is what I want to see. I want to see the creativity. And the fact that you can talk that fast about the things that are going on in your brain. I mean, that's a skill. That was awesome. And that's not in the script. That's not in the script that no, no one said, you know, when you get to this part, tell them yes. to get in your head and then talk a mile a minute with all these thoughts racing. No, that you, you brought that. Um, Chris, absolutely. And Kelly, if I could add, I think if, if I could say one thing, I think the origin of my um, my question comes from what he says, uh, like wanting to not make it a lecture, mm -hmm. but not wanting to lean on non-stimulating group involvement. Mm -hmm. Does that, if that if that makes sense. yeah, so having that balance where where I can not make it a lecture, but have original connection stuff, but not have to be too with it and sometimes you just got to say okay what does that mean to you yeah. give me feedback but sometimes i just get a little like i want something original so it's not yeah. you know, so i can have people really connect to it and um and but the, and i don't want it to i don't want to pass it up opportunities just to have interaction and then it turns into a lecture so i think that's that's kind of what i think about so, so chris yeah. i just attended a national coaching conference that was fabulous and um Jerry, Jerry Lynch, I think is the name, sports psychologist from Santa Cruz, works with the Warriors. He's, uh, I may not have the right last name, but, but it was a, a dynamic, fun weekend. And, he, you know, at the end he goes, you know, if you, if you like what you learned here, 90% of it I got from someone else. So, so yeah. he he's original. This guy is original. He's his own person. He has his own personality. And everything he did with this, I thought it was his. But in the end, he said, it, you know, actually, it wasn't. You know, so 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 sometimes putting pressure on yourself to be original um, can work against you and take away from a good. I mean, if you saw Kelly do something and you go, what a great way of doing it. Do it, you yeah. know. You know, and, and then on the other hand, if you go, I like what Kelly did, I would make this little change and it fits, then do that. But um, the, the point I wanted to add to what Kelly said is you said, um, one of the things I like about PCA is that we keep things simple. You said that, it's just, I, I'm paraphrasing, but at some point yeah. you alluded to that's part of the beauty and brilliance, quite honestly, of Jim Thompson, because he's the original one. Who, who made it simple, you know? And so as you get creative, as you have fun, as you do non-traditional experience with your, you know, you, you want to make sure that you don't overwhelm the simplicity. For example, if they, if, if they at the end of the Elm section, 
you say, okay, and what is it, what does ELM stand for? And if no one can tell you effort, learning, and mistakes are okay, then I feel like, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't get the main simple mm -hmm. concept, you know, so, yeah. Cool. And I awesome. Think, you know, and Ruben's right, question, I mean, we've seen, we've seen so many trainers try so many cool things. And as Ruben said, I mean, I keep a highlighter literally in my notebook. And when I have an idea I want to steal, I highlight it. And I call it, it's R&D. It's rip off and duplicate, whatever I see people do. <laughs> and I get to see people do a ton of this. So, That's good. Yeah. But again, it's, it's a matter of what Ruben said. Like we have seen trainers do brilliantly clever ideas. And then we've seen trainers that have taken something really simple and confuse the heck out of it. <laughs> You're like, where are they going? Like they're trying so hard. So I think you have a good, right now, this format of doing this on a Google Hangout really limits you to what you can do when sure. you're out in a room with coaches. And we get that, we know that. But as Ruben said, we want you to know the trade. We want you to know the, the standard so that you can add to it, enhance it, motivate it, make it better. But if you don't cool. know the standard first, you know, then you don't have a structure to go on. Got it. So that would be, that would be, um, when I, when I was going through some of this, Chris, again, I was highlighting more than, uh, writing down feedback, which is great, but I really like a couple of the things that I remember mentioning to you last time. I really liked the way you did bring in your own expertise. I also asked you to bring in some examples of your own from coaching, which you did. Um, and I like the way you were creative and clever and your personality keeps our attention, which is, which is awesome. Um, at first I wrote down, what did I write? I write down like, oh, I, I write down suggestions and then you do them, which I love. You, you did something and I was like, oh, I want to see you. I want to see us practice during the workshop. Like earlier when you were going through some of the tools, I was like, oh, I'd love to see Chris have coaches get up and actually practice it. And then the next thing you did was, okay, let's practice the mistake ritual. And I was like, boom, that's exactly what we cool. want the coach to get used to practicing. Um, you know, I've even asked coaches to say, uh, what, is, what is effort? Because yeah, how many of you value effort over practice? Yep, I do. Okay, how many of your nine-year-olds, if I pulled them aside and said, what's coach looking for when I say give max effort, they can't give me an answer. So I want you all to call out, notice effort in your sport in baseball. What's effort look like? What kind of things will come out of your mouth to show your athletes that you value effort? And it's such mm -hmm. a simple exercise, but coaches are like, come on, keep your eye on the ball. You know, just keep your eye on the ball, value effort at all. Nope, not at all um hustle you know i've heard coaches yell hustle 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 these kids don't know where to hustle i've had kids that have hustled back on defense when the ball's on attack you know be specific and so just exercises like that to get coaches to actually practice in workshops the only other thing chris is and i know you'll do this too is that people learn really well in groups of mixing up the ages and mixing up like i've had a lot of workshops where i've mixed up coaches that coach you know u6 and u15 and you put them all together in a big group and they get to share ideas and more so it is idea sharing, but it's also because coaches don't get a lot of opportunities to share their coaching strategies with other coaches. So this workshop, the reason we call it a workshop is to look for opportunities to get the coaches sharing their ideas with each other. And then you don't necessarily have to be the expert on everything because you've got a whole room of experts yeah. that, are, that are, and then you can pump up their tanks, cool. fill their tanks by saying, that's a great idea. I love that. That's fantastic. Um, especially if you're doing a workshop in a sport that's not your area of expertise. Um, I did a, I did a water polo workshop one time and I was like, all right, I need as many examples from them as I possibly can. Cause I've never played water polo. Um, yeah. and it just, it, you know, I was the expert in the room, but they gave me some fantastic examples and all I had to link, all I had to do was link them to the tools and principles. So it's just a good opportunity. Um, but again, I loved a lot of your, the phraseology that you use the word choice I thought was excellent. And, um, you know, even the, where your attention goes, your energy flows, like that one's highlighted. I love that. That's great. I'm going to remember that for my next tennis game when I'm trying not to hit the ball into the net. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that will help me a lot. Great. Thank you. Thank you very yeah, much. So, so let me ask you this, and I've been doing this a couple, uh, to a couple of people. I mean, the idea of these Google Hangouts is for you to practice. But again, I don't think there's any better practice than getting out and doing it. So I give you three opportunities to do these demos with me. But I mean, in my, as far as I'm concerned, I feel like you're ready to get out there and just practice in front of people. So if you would like to do another demo for me, that's perfectly fine. But I'd rather you get out with a real trainer and do it live if you're comfortable doing that. So I just want yeah, to see what you're uh, feeling. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm ready. So I, I'd like to. 
You, you are ready, Chris. You are yes. ready. Kelly, I am so much in favor of getting Chris doing this in a live workshop as soon as possible. And I don't know what the workshop load right now, you know, this we're in the summer. So the calendar is, is much more light than it would be come, you know, August, September, but, but 